Five, four, three, two, one. Drop that. Welcome to the Test Guild Security Podcast. We're all getting together to learn more about security testing with your host, Joe Calantonio. Hey, it's Joe, and welcome to another episode of the Test Guild Security Podcast. Today, we'll be talking with Julian Vian all about security and DevOps. Julian is the author of the book, Securing DevOps, Security in the Cloud, and is a security architect at Mozilla with over 15 years of experience. He specializes in web application security, cloud infrastructure, cryptography, risk management, and more. You don't want to miss this episode. Check it out. It's no secret that the number and complexity of applications are growing. But what is alarming is that 90% of security incidents result from exploits against defects in software. The need for better application security has never been higher, and MicroFocus Fortify is here to help. Fortify is the recognized market leader in application security, and it is the most comprehensive and scalable application security solution that works with your current development tools and processes. With Fortify, you can start security applications in a single day, including custom code, open source, or commercial components, and scale as your needs grow with an on-premise, as-a-service, or hybrid implementation. Check them out, head on over to microfocus.com forward slash app security. Hey, Julian. Welcome to the Guild. Hey, Joe. Thanks a lot for having me. Great to have you on the show. Um, as I mentioned, we're really going to dive into your book. But before we get into it, could you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, I run the Firefox operations team at Mozilla, uh, Firefox operations security team at Mozilla. And we focus on the security of uh, the backend infrastructure of Firefox. So Firefox is a browser, but it's also a lot of cloud services. And every time you use Firefox, you end up talking to a fairly large set of those services hosted in various cloud environments. And uh, the role of my team and, and my role is to keep those environments as secure as possible. Uh, so I um, spend a lot of my time in the cloud. Uh, I spend a lot of my time thinking about uh, threat models and attack vectors and secure software and application security and infrastructure security and all that fun stuff. And I come from uh, more of a systems engineering and a network engineering background years ago before we had the clouds and uh, slowly made my way into security and uh, to the point where uh, it became, it devoured entirely my uh, my occupation and and, um, and that's what I do day to day now. And I'm also the author of a book called Securing DevOps, uh, which is really a compilation of techniques on how to run secure cloud services, uh, particularly in AWS, but that can also be applied to many other cloud environments. And that explains a lot of the techniques that we developed and implemented uh, during my time at Mozilla. Now, writing a book takes a lot of time. I ask authors this all the time. Why, why, why did you feel the need to write this book? Oh, that's that's a very. <laughs> I think it's 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 some sort of a bucket list item. You have to do it, right? If 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 you're that kind of person, you have to do it, and you're going to do it at some point. And uh, this was the right time for me to do it. I had a topic I was interested in. Um, I uh, was pushed into it a little bit by my family on one side and, and my editor who reached out on the other side and I figured, why not? And, and if you're going to do it, might as well go all in and, and write a book that is interested and interesting and comprehensive. So that's, that's what I went for. But it, it did consume all of my free time for almost two years. So right. that's not necessarily wow. something I recommend people do. No doubt. Well, it shows. So I'm really, really glad you did write it. Thank you. So the book is uh, bro- broken out into three main sections. You have securing DevOps, uh, watching for anomalies, protecting services against attacks, and maturing DevOps security. So I thought we'd go into each section and maybe pull out a topic out of each area. The, the first one, I-, I guess, is why do you think security must be part of a uh, really important part of your product development? Well, I think it's the only way we're ever going to have secure products and secure services. I think trying to, uh, the the same way when you you build a house, you don't call your uh, security engineers at the end to like 
add reliability and safety to your house. It's it's part of the design, right? That's that's how things are built to, to be safe. Um, it's the same with software. You have from the very beginning to consider how it can be misused, what impact it could have if it gets attacked, et cetera, et cetera, and bake those controls directly into the software, the service, the infrastructure uh, themselves. And um, so gradually over time, what we're going to see is that the organization that resists attacks and, and that provides secure software are the ones who are taking uh, security seriously and integrate security considerations as part of their uh, software design. Um, we, we use the term shifting left in the industry, which really refers to moving the security discussion to the beginning of the software engineering lifecycle, the SDLC. And that's really what it's about. It's, it's If you want to have secure software, if you want to have secure cloud services, you need to take these considerations uh, into account from the very, very beginning. You work for a large organization. Just curious to know, like, how do you get buy-in to actually do this approach? Because obviously it's not like free. It isn't. Uh, what we find is that it gets cheaper over time uh, because at first, what most organizations that, that adopt uh, th this type of security integration do is that they, they first focus on uh, the technical aspects. So they focus on automated testing, they focus on uh, integrating security testing in CI, CD, etc. But over time, uh, they start creating a culture of security in their organizations. They start talking to their developers earlier and earlier. Um, they start talking to their operations team earlier and earlier. And um, the cost of having those security discussions and of shaping uh, software to be secure reduces over time. And what uh, we found doing this at Mozilla is that it is actually cheaper to have security discussions early on uh, now than it is to have them further down the pipeline or to have them like we did a few years ago. So it ends up being a cost-saving uh, uh, really process for most organizations that, that do it right. And once uh, the rest of the organization, the developers, the product managers, the operators they realize that, they, they just buy into it. Interesting. So uh, if you worked in an agile team and someone starts a new a new feature as part of their sprint, is is security part of the definition of done or is, is it like just understood that we need a plan for security for this particular feature before we release it? I think it's part of the definition of done. Um, we, the way we, <clears throat> we, we started using checklists, security checklists specifically a few years ago. And uh, what we realized over time is that we were giving the security checklists to the engineers uh, and the, the project managers would actually take those checklists and add them to uh, the acceptance criteria for, for the projects without us asking. So they, they really considered the project to be done, to be feature complete, or the sprint to be feature complete once security was also done. Uh, and, and that's really, it's not even something we asked for. <laughs> it just came from the culture, right? Uh, and that's a better, better model, I think. That's where we started seeing the best results. Well, that's awesome. So it sounds like once you have buy-in, you have like this culture that's embracing it. What are some steps you think folks need to do to create like a bare bones DevOps pipeline for the security efforts? And that's That goes back to why the book is structured this way. Um, I think that the first phase, and, and I try to model the book around the idea of a three-year plan. Um, so imagine you're starting, you're the first security engineer in a fairly small organization, and um, this is year one, and nobody else is focused on security, what are you really going to work on? And chances are you're going to first look at uh, the infrastructure security and you're going to look at the technical aspects of running services and, and websites in that infrastructure. And that's fine uh, because if you can secure the infrastructure, um, everything else will become automatically a lot more secure. Um, so the first year is really focused on um, well, infrastructure and after that, application security as well, but at very technical levels, automated testing, how do you run your test in CI, CD? How do you run your test uh, continuously? How do you communicate the results of those tests to your developers, et cetera, et cetera? And um, the second year is when hopefully, um, for some organization, it goes faster, for some, it takes longer. Uh, you can start looking into fraud and abuse and, and detecting 
malicious activity inside of your environment. Um, third year is hopefully you have uh, mastered uh, fraud detection and incident response and you have good infrastructure and application security. And you can start thinking about more strategic uh, items like risk management or threat modeling. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that someone who gets started on this like will start right away from a threat modeling point of view, uh, mostly because threat modeling is only really effective once you have a security culture in an organization. Otherwise, you just you just that security guy in a corner of the room telling people they're going to get hacked by the NSA and no one cares, right? <laughs> so you need to have created uh, some buy-in before you can effectively do that threat modeling. Are there any tools that you use or you recommend people use in their DevOps pipelines to help them with their testing? So the, the tool we've probably invested uh, in the most is the OWASP Z attack, attack proxy, ZAP. Uh, and we use that extensively uh, throughout our entire set of services to audit. We have something we call the ZAP baseline scan that essentially goes look uh, at our applications for uh, default security headers, default security parameters that we want to have everywhere. Uh, and that's a tool that Zap is very popular. It has a lot of uh, integrations with various CI CD platforms. Um, I know a lot of people use it with Jenkins, for example. And it is, most people are very successful with it. Um, we have grown, um, there are a lot of tools that do uh, infrastructure security. Uh, I like, uh, Scott Piper's Cloud Mapper for AWS. I think he does a, a great job growing that platform and it really helps find issues in AWS environments. And you can automate that to run continuous tests against an AWS account. So if you start putting these tools together, there isn't like one tool that does everything. And I don't think there should be. I think it's better to have specialized tools because you can compose them to match what your organization is using and then automate these tools to, uh, for example, automatically raise issues when they find a problem or block a production deployment. Um, so that's what we do. And then we, we grew, we've grew, we grown a number of tools internally. Uh, we implement and we built our own uh, unit testing framework for uh, infrastructure tests. Uh, so both AWS and Google Cloud, and we're adding, we're adding we added Heroku, I think, and we have Azure as well. So we can run things like check that uh, all of the database backups are encrypted, for example, and we can run those tests continuously. It's it's harder for me to recommend like one specific tool that does this well because what I found is that it, it is often better for organizations to build their own tools and build their own test suites uh, and to actually collaborate with the operations teams and the developers on what those security tests should be. Um, because coming up with the what we used to do in the past is take a scanner and we'd output a report with like 200 failures and then go to your devs and say, can we fix those? <laughs> and, and they wouldn't they look at it and be like, what do you expect me to do with this? Um, so rather than doing it this way, I prefer the approach of, of cherry picking a few areas where we want to improve, working with the devs and the ops, getting buy-in, then writing the tests, then getting everything in compliance with the test, and then moving on to another level of test. And using homegrown tools is better for that process. You did mention checklist, and people always ask me for checklist. Is that part of the book? I didn't see your security checklist uh, in the book. So I probably didn't mention it in there. Um, the way we use security checklists is that we essentially have a master checklist that we will give to developers every time they start a new project. And that has everything uh, from like infrastructure security, um, security headers, TLS configurations, uh, common issues we find when um, developers implement APIs in, in, in AWS, for example. Like if you proxy web requests, you have to protect your instance metadata endpoint. And we, we found that issue in enough application that we, we put that in the checklist. Like, hey, watch out for this. It's a common problem. Um, and so that checklist is a mix of industry best practices, but also uh, issues we've uh, learned about both from our own security work, but also from our bug bounty programs. And we want to tell the devs to watch out for them. Um, that master checklist uh, usually gets split up depending on what the developers are working on. So we will, uh, when they start a new project, we'll take the checklist and we will discard the stuff that doesn't apply to them. 
um, what we commonly discard is the entire infrastructure security section because most developers will host their applications in the core infrastructure. And so they follow the paved road model of inheriting all of the controls that exist in that infrastructure, the, the default TLS configuration, the, the default log management, the default secrets deployment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they don't need to worry at all about this, right? Um, and over time, the checklist that we end up giving to developers actually becomes shorter and shorter because we're implementing better default and better core infrastructure, better paved road for everyone. And so they have to worry about less and less of the security perimeter. The people who want to do their own thing and host their applications elsewhere, they have to worry about the entire thing. Uh, and that's actually a good argument to discourage them from doing shadow IT. It's like, well, if you do it yourself, you have to do all of this yourself, which is a lot of work. If you host it properly, you don't. So once you, you have your developers, the, 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 they have the checklist, they're trying to write more secure code uh, before it actually gets to when you know someone's just hacking it when it's in production. Um, what are some things you could do to know if you are, are being hacked? Um, like, are there any ways you can look at log files, look for anomalies, and or to protect yourself from those kind of attacks or intrusions? Yes. So that's this is an area where security teams spend a lot of their time. Uh, in, in in most organizations that reach a certain size, you will find security teams that are focused on fraud detection on incident response, et cetera, and threat hunting, all that stuff. Uh, what I would recommend uh, developers do from the get-go is standardize your log formats, first of all. That's that's the most important thing. Nowadays, most applications are built inside of Docker containers. You can output uh, application logs just on the standard out of the Docker container. Just use a standard, like, simple maybe a JSON format for uh, application logs and take those application logs, take the web logs and put them in a standard log management facility. So if you're in AWS, you have CloudWatch logs. If you're in GCP, you have Stackdriver, et cetera, et cetera. Every single platform has a way for applications to publish their logs into a central place. And the very first step, uh, to take is is just to have some very basic rules around um, traffic that doesn't look like the normal pattern. So if you know that, for example, a client should never make more than five requests a minute, then just have an alert on that, and you'll find a whole lot of stuff that that isn't uh, normal traffic that may be uh, may lead to detecting a bunch of IPs that are malicious, and then. Um, from that point on, um, the fraud detection logic becomes more and more complex over time, depending on what the application does, depending on what uh, the traffic, whether it's a public or internal application, et cetera. Um, we use very, very different techniques for even for applications that may look the same from the outside, but in fact end up doing very different things. Um, at that point, though, if you're running a service that is popular enough that you're getting a significant amount of fraudulent traffic, um, you probably should have someone like, spend a significant portion of their time fighting fraud on this. Uh, but it's always easier to do uh, if you have standardized logs and they're going to um, a standard log pipeline and it's easy to query and visualize and run some simple detection scripts on those logs. Great. So it sounds like it, it all depends on certain things. Is this where risk management comes in, like where you should focus your energy? Because I, I assume it's a lot of things you could do with security and you can't do all of them. So is risk management something that comes into play of maybe we should put extra efforts into our logs or detecting intrusions? I think so. Uh, I, at, at varying degrees of complexity. When, when you say risk management, people usually think of those massive spreadsheet that NASA would do to uh, for example, to figure out what could go wrong with sending a rocket to the moon or something like this. And it, it doesn't need to be that uh, complicated. In, in fact, uh, most people, particularly um, product managers and, and, and business managers, are just naturally good at risk management. They, they do it in every business decision they make, essentially. And so applying that to security isn't very different. So it's it's fairly simple for a team of engineers to just sit 
uh, around the table once in a while and look at an application and ask, how would we attack this from the outside? What what is what are the risks? Like, what's the most dangerous thing that could happen to this application? And and that usually gives a lot of interesting pointers. You may, for example, have one application where the most dangerous vulnerability would be risk would be to leak the data. So you have a confidentiality risk. And so what are you going to build? You're not going to build a right limiting uh, security control if your risk is leaking data. You'll probably go look at your database permission. You'll probably go look at um, you know SSH connections to the production infrastructure, all of that stuff that, that may lead to um, leaking data or accessing data uh, fraudulently. Another application that, that may be very similar in design may in fact have uh, mostly an availability risk that if it's down, then the rest of the company cannot function. And so you're losing money very, very quickly. Maybe you don't have a confidentiality risk there, but you really, really want to be fully available at all times. And, and those discussions are not complex in, in nature. There is no risk framework involved with just asking, what do we need to be worried about here? And, and the solutions usually come naturally. Then there's a question of how do you prioritize this? And, and that's where, well, if you have a really, really long list uh, of non-obvious priorities, it can be a bit complicated and, and you can get into more uh, uh, complex risk management frameworks to help with that. Uh, but I would say for most organization, you can always start with what are the top three, top five problems that we want to protect against and focus on those. And, and for many organizations that will be, well, a break-in is a major issue, both from a reputation perspective and maybe from a regulation perspective. And so we need to focus on protecting all of the access points. Um, that's that's the kind of exercise that we like to have internally with, with our developers like fairly early on is asking those questions. But honestly, I think it, any organization should be having those discussions regularly. Absolutely. So you used a, a term in the book that I haven't seen before. I've heard of a test-driven development, behavior-driven development, domain-driven development, but you have something called test-driven security. Uh, is that something you coined? And if so, like, can you, can you give an example of what tr- test-driven security is? It, it is... Um, I, I don't think I coined it. I think I've heard it elsewhere before. Perhaps the, the book has the, the, the more fleshed out definition of it. I think the, the main idea behind it was really to push security engineers to define the security controls that they want to see implemented everywhere from the beginning. Right, and, and then to let developers essentially go through the failing tests and fix them over time. So the same way you would do test-driven development, you write your te- you need test first, and then you go implement the functions. Here you would have your security test, and if you're starting a new project, it will have none of the security requirements implemented, so it will fail all of the security tests. But the goal here is to tell the, the, the developers which tests are failing and to have enough documentation that they understand why the test is failing and how to fix it and why that's important so that they can go fix it. And by the time the application reaches production, it has all of the passing tests uh, done. I'll be honest, this I've had mixed success with this approach. What we found is that the technical implementation of test-driven security with security tests running in CI, CD uh, continuously hasn't really caught on. Uh, and I think it's a mix of like our security tools don't really work perfectly in those environments. They're still kind of heavy. And also there's always this weird part of the code isn't, the security code isn't necessarily owned by the devs. And so it doesn't get full adoption. What works well is, like I said, the checklist works well. And letting developers essentially self-assess when they feel they're ready. And we do that by exposing our security tools to them. Uh, for example, observatory.mozilla.org is a website where you can uh, request a scan of your uh, application or website. And, and it will tell you if you don't have a good content security policy, it will tell you if you're missing security headers. And we found that developers uh, like to use sites and, and products like these. And that seems to be more successful. But the, the core concept of test-driven security where you essentially will fail your CI, uh, if you don't have all of the tests implemented, that, that's still something that we haven't really found the way to make it click everywhere. 
Great. So another technique that you mentioned, you actually mentioned that you uh, took the feedback and incorporated into your checklist was uh, bug bounties. I've heard of bug bounties before, but how does it work with security? Well, um, it's it's pretty easy. You 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 basically tell people to come hack you for money. <laughs> it's it's basically how it is. The the, the way uh, so Mozilla has had a bug bounty program both for Firefox itself and and for the web uh, services we run for maybe fifteen years now, uh, maybe more than that. I'm not I'm not quite sure, but it's been a long time. Um, so it's always been part of the culture internally. And we, we really have a good relationship with a lot of researchers. What we got from it is essentially when we create, uh, even on our existing services or new services, when we create new application, new services, we can, without putting any money up front, uh, expose those services to a population of uh, fairly skilled security researchers. And they will go look for bugs. And, and if they find bugs, they will report them to us privately, so we have time to patch them, and and we'll pay them money to you thank them. So the amount that we pay depends on what they find. So we have a on uh, if you search for Mozilla Web Bug Bounty, uh, you will find a page that describes uh, the payouts per categories of vulnerabilities, and it's we pay more for our core sites. Uh, then we pay for our non-core sites and we pay more for remote code execution than we pay for like a cross-site scripting attack. Uh, so it varies uh, depending on, on on the vulnerability found. Um, a lot of organizations, so we run our bug bounty program ourselves, but a lot of organizations rely on uh, third-party vendors to do that. Uh, there are many of them, uh, Bug Crowd and uh, HackerOne, uh, two of them that are fairly popular that will enlist your organization uh, and and expose it to uh, researchers and and help triage uh, the large number of vulnerabilities that uh, that get found. Um, there is, I will I will say though that before starting a bug bounty program, it's always good to check in with the lawyers um, because there are some well regulations uh, that need to be taken into account. We have published some of our approaches uh, on uh, the Mozilla security blog of doing what we call safe harbor, which is basically uh, a safe, uh, legally safe environment for researchers to come essentially uh, research vulnerabilities against our website without uh, risking um, essentially legal action from us. Um, so there are rules to be followed on both sides, uh, but it's something that, organization should consider before starting a bug bounty program. Okay, Jillian, before we go, is there one piece of actionable advice you can give someone to help them with their security DevOps testing efforts? And what's the best way to find, contact you, or get our hands on your awesome book? Sure. Our, the book, so that's that's a pretty easy question. You can go to securing-devops.com and it will automatically send you to uh, to the book page uh, and you can get your uh, paper copy, ebook copy, or both from there directly. The piece of advice I would give to people tr- implementing a security strategy in their DevOps organization is to break the barriers between teams as early as possible. The most important aspect of building a successful security organization inside a DevOps team is to be able to talk to people often and about everything. And uh, when I started in the cloud services group at Mozilla, I was actually a member of the operations team reporting to the operations manager. Uh, I was in the room with all of the systems engineers and operations engineers, and we were working on incidents together and we were working on operations together. There were no barriers. We build trust that way. And uh, one thing that often lacks in security organizations is that they're not necessarily trusted by their peers uh, because they're too far away, because they're trying to do everything through uh, tests and through uh, bug reports and and et cetera. And that's not how you build trust. So if you want to really build a, a successful security organization, break the barriers, go work directly with the developers, directly with the operators, share their successes and their failures uh, and and really uh, create a cohesive group this way. Thank you, Julian, for your security testing awesomeness. For links to everything of value we covered in this episode, head on over to testguild.com forward slash S10. 
And while you're there, make sure to click on the Try It Today link under the exclusive sponsors section to learn all about Microfocus Fortify, which is the recognized market leader in application security. So that's it for this episode of the Test Guild Security Testing Podcast. I'm Joe, and my mission is to help you succeed with creating end-to-end full-stack automation awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Guild Security Podcast. Head on over to testguild.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and online testing conferences. Make sure to subscribe to join the guild and continue your testing journey. This has been a Joe Calantonio production.